Hello, everybody, and welcome to the channel. Today, I'm joined by Tom and Susie from Goblin King Games to talk all things a multi award winning Moonstone. Uh, but before we get into that, we've never really had a chance to delve into the background and the history of, of Goblin King Games and Moonstone uh, as a company itself, Tom. So for people who are unaware, um, before it became multi award winning, it was just plain old Moonstone. <laughs> Do you want to take us yeah, through so, uh, where you came from and how you got here? Yeah, so I, um, I, I'm, you know, didn't come from a, a, an industry background or anything like that. I was just playing games with friends, and um, I'd always like to dabble. Uh, I'd always create mods for games and, and and make like small games for friends that seemed to be going down well. But I um, was helping out a friend with one of his games, helping him write some rules. And I was thinking, well, if I had my own game, I would do this. And I'd have bits of Brian Froud influence and Rackham kind of uh, miniatures kind of style, because that's what I really like. I really like kind of whimsical fairy tale look. And I um, really like the idea of a, a combat mechanic that was interactive because I was doing historical European martial arts in my spare time. So I just made a game, basically. I just made up a game with no intention of it ever being played by anyone other than me and my friends. Mm -hmm. um, and it's sort of grown over a long period of time with me um, building sort of as and when I can sort of, re you know, whenever you make a, a sculpt or um, release a box set, reinvesting that money back into making the next models. And just, it's kind of built very organically. Yeah. And over the way, especially recently, where it's sort of picked up a lot of events and I've been able to add on um, some stuff. So uh, Susie, who's on the call uh, with us, uh, is our narrative lead and also helps out with marketing. Um, I've still got my dad. He's still next door, packing boxes, shipping out people's orders. So it's still got still got our roots. Um, but we've got uh, another um, very good um, ops person, Jilly, who does packing and assembly. Uh, we've got Mick Green, who's the incredible board builder, who a lot of people know, and he's um, sort of an office manager type role now. Mm -hmm. And we've got Joe Parsons, who's um, a super brain, quite frankly, he just sort of reads the matrix code when it comes to tabletop games and can spot anything that might be broken a mile off, which is excellent. It stops me releasing. I base my role now is to come up with stupid ideas for mechanics. And he makes sure that they're that they're fun and that they're balanced and they play well. So that's sort of the division of labour. So yes, it's been quite a journey to get here, but we're in a really really strong place now. I want to circle back to mechanics a little bit later um, because it's it's a fascinating thing and it also ties into character design as well. Um, but when you came across and we we did some playthrough videos, uh, that was on the cusp of the uh, the launch of the Arising. And at that stage, it was just you yourself, and you weren't even full time with Goblin King at that stage. You were, yeah, that was uh, that was a fun time. Yeah, I, I think at that point, I had a, a full time job. At one point, I managed to go go freelance, and so I could spend a bit more time on Moonstone. But that was building back up. So I think I was full time and on my own. That was that was heavy going, <laughs> but it was well worth it to get to get through that and have a successful launch of the Arising. Um, we picked up tons of new players during that uh, arising kickstarter campaign and susie was not being paid but helping out anyway <laughs> at the time so uh so we had you know me and susie worked together closely on that arising campaign and um it was sort of the launch really of, of me being able to quit my job go full time and sort of accelerate things live the dream <laughs> living the dream exactly <laughs> So how did you get suckered in then, Susie? <laughs> so I was a player of Moonstone uh, before uh, I, I offered my expertise to become mm -hmm. a writer. Um, and I first saw Moonstone at the first salute I think Tom was at, where Tom was by himself at a table at the very back of the hall um, with a board, um, just yeah, just him, and had also co-opted some space from one of the other um, stands to put his stock. 
And um, I was with some friends and we walked around the hall. And as we walked past the table, I glanced over to see what was going on and saw fairies mm. and basically just went, there's, I've never seen fairies in a miniatures game before. Um, Tom was showing a, a, a kid and I assume their dad um, how to play. So I thought I won't shove the kid out of the way. I'll come back. <laughs> so, yeah. That's exactly what happened. I remember it now. <laughs> yeah, 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 but it. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to shove anybody, it's probably fairies. You don't know the easy yeah, thing and- to go for. I wish I had, because by the time we came back, you'd sold out a fairy. So I didn't even end up with the, the models that I wanted. But I still bought the, the starter set and yeah. I bought the hard book rule book. That sounds really cool that we sold out, but we, 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 were, we were so tiny. We didn't have very many. <laughs> we six boxes. No, but I remember feeling so, so disappointed because the fairies are amazing. Um, and then went away and um, built them. And, and then um, I ended up backing the Leshevolt Kickstarter. So I went all all in on that Kickstarter and joined the uh, Facebook community mm-hmm. and um, started listening to podcasts and watching interviews and things and thought, this is really fun. And I developed a headcanon about um, Brunhilde mm. and um, was like, this is kind of fun. The guys who run this seem quite open. Tom seems pretty open. So actually it was Richie, who was our, our previous narrative lead, who unfortunately had to step back. But fortunately for me, meant that I could then step up and take that role. So yeah, it was good for me. Um, but I reached out to him and said, I've got this headcanon. Here's my idea. And he loved it. And I, out of somewhere, said, I fancy myself as a bit of a writer. <laughs> if you want help with writing anything, I'd, I'd love to be involved because the world is just fantastic. Um, and uh, he said, yeah, sure, send me something. And I had to then scrabble around for something that was in a presentable state that I could send to someone else because everything I'd done to that point was my own writing for my own kind of pleasure on a Sunday afternoon, just writing a story. Um, so it was incredibly nerve wracking because I didn't actually know if I could write. I just mm-hmm. thought I could and sent it to my friend Katie as well, who was the editor for The Arising and said to her, am I deluded uh, or is this all right? And she said, no, this is good. You should send it. And then that's kind of where it all started, really. I mean, that's that's fascinating in and of itself um, because when you look at The Rising as a book, um, it's massive. Uh, yeah. It's almost <laughs> double the size of the rules of the, yeah. the original book. <laughs> and there's so much more narrative fiction in there. Mm. Uh, <laughs> yep. How much of that um, had been planned out in advance, Tom, or was this just a case of, oh, we've got somebody who's going to write for us quickly? <laughs> here's here's the line. There, and- there was a, there was a framework, yeah. but it, it seems he probably did make it twice as long. <laughs> um, but it was it was really nice working on the rising because when we did the rule book, we did a Kickstarter that was the game, which was miniatures and rules. Hmm. So we we kind of on a quite a tight timeline. You got. A, design all the miniatures, play test all the miniatures, write the rules, do all, you know, all the graphic design. So we couldn't lavish quite as much time on it as we could in the arising where it was, it was just a book and we were going to focus on the book. Um, so it grew, but it grew very nicely. Um, and it's, it's a really good story. If anyone hasn't bought the arising, go and buy the arising. It's a cracking story. It's a, it's a nice book and it will be the foundation for what's going to come. So our first rule book, as a collection of short stories, there's not it's not the beginning of a story, whereas the arising is the beginning of a story. You know, the, we we have grand plans, which Susie will virtually kick me under the table if I start to say too much. But we have very very exciting plans, and I will say no more than that. And the, the arising is the first, the, effectively the first of a trilogy that will build somewhere very cool. That yeah. Well, well, we'll have to see if we can separate you out a bit further so you can you can tell us about <laughs> yeah. it too hard, or at least, I mean, bruises bruises go away, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> and we have already established I've tackled a small child, so I would. Yeah. I- <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, just, it's just steps. It's the path to the dark side in that respect. Um, so if we before we, we get into the, the grand plans and what's coming up, um, the world of Tauber, uh, I say the world of Tauber because Tauber is actually is it a continent itself. It's not actually the world. Yeah, it's the islands. It's yeah. it's the it's this thing hmm. behind us. 
Uh, so the initial factions, um, for want of a better word, the Commonwealth and the Dominion, um, they, in many respects, they're a lot more free than a lot of other fantasy games. You don't have a, a clear delineation between humans go here, yeah. elves go here, goblins are evil. It's it's much more nuanced in many respects. Um, and in the initial rules, you, you get the little flavor for each like Baron von Fancy Hats um, ballad, things like that. They're, they're all the very nation and it, it lends that taste of how the world um, is. Like you say, the horizon is much more structured, much more a narrative story. I, was, I had this it? idea with the, the Commonwealth and the Dominion that this would be a peaceful place because there are so many games where it's nations at war, factions at war. I was like, what if this place is actually quite peaceful? You know, there are different, you know, politically opposed factions, but they cohabit okay. It's all fine. That would be an interesting setting. And it also, when we didn't have very many models, allowed us to have um, more different ways you could build a list. Because if we said, you, if you play humans, you are the human faction, um, it's very limiting because we only had six models <laughs> at the time for humans. Whereas if we said it's Commonwealth and it's humans and gnomes, even though you've still got only the six humans that we launched with and the six gnomes we've launched with, it gave people a way, even at the start, to kind of mix and match and make, you know, make list building a bit more interesting. Mm. And I, I think that's still the case because um, we've only we've got a limited number of factions. We're not saying if you play these guys, you play these guys. We're kind of giving the players the options to make up their own lists and seeing them do that is really good fun. With some of the the, the cross-faction that's come in, and, and obviously there's more with La Chivalte coming in as well, mm -hmm. um, it blurs the lines further. When you're coming up with a, a character, do you start with, where they're going to fit in the character themselves or an idea for a, a concept like a, a paladin or a cleric or i want something x and you're thinking well that would be a good fit for them. where they usually come from is somebody who's probably drunk at the time comes up with a ridiculous idea mm -hmm. and tells me i've had this brilliant idea for a character and i go that is a brilliant idea for a character. And sometimes it's ones that I've come up with, but more often than not these days, it's they come from all over the place. And then they go into my big, massive pile of awesome ideas, <laughs> which is still over brimming. Uh, and I just keep chucking stuff into it all the time. That's a brilliant idea. Um, and then when we're structuring a, a new book or a new, new release wave, uh, the Arising was effectively the second block and we, we're planning uh, you know, to go all the way through to four. I look at this ginormous list of awesome ideas and think, right, how can we group them together into themes? How can we make sure that all the factions and all the sub-factions are all getting something? Um, and we sort of work together to build, a, a, you know, a giant table of you know, all the box sets and what's the theme going to be for that and who's going to hate who and we want to make sure that everybody gets something. Um, and occasionally there are holes, and we're like, ah, oh, we've only got two characters for this theme. Let's come up with another idea. More often, we're like, ah, oh, damn, we've got five awesome ideas for this theme, and we can only have three. So we'll chop that one out. We'll maybe move that one over there and repurpose them a little bit, and we'll put that one over back into the pile, and we'll come back to that for the next book. So we're never short of ideas, that's for sure. We're never ever going to run out of ideas. No, and it, it's always the gameplay that wins out. So um, Tom and I talk about this quite a lot, that it's, it is the, the gameplay is the most important thing. And then it's the um, the artwork and the miniatures that, that kind of are then linked to but come second. And then third to that is the story. Um, and so I uh don't i have ideas for characters i have i flesh out their personalities their relationships i have particularly in my head not necessarily written down um but i do wait until tom and joe have progressed along to a point before really starting to fix certain things to a character um so that we don't get kind of things muddled up or it's so that they don't go in one direction in my head I've gone another and then it clashes we're we're, we're very good actually at working together um to progress them along 
And every so often, um, it's my narrative stuff that then comes in and squeezes in a character or two. Um, so Dranya is an example of that, mm-hmm. um, where um, I wanted to introduce a, a trickster spirit um, and came up with a, a shape-changing kind of concept. And then in that conversation at the beginning of last year, the three of us got together and, and talked through different different options for, for book three. Um, okay. And Dranya kind of came out of that mix of saying, it'd be really cool to have a character that's mid-shape change. It would just be really fun to have a miniature that's like that. And so that kind of led that. So occasionally it comes from left field through the, the story, but often it's from the, the gameplay. I mean, um, oh, I'm, I'm going to get myself sidetracked here. So I'll, I'll have to try and focus where I'm going myself. But with the likes of Dranya, then she appeared um, guiding Eric in his storyline. Um, that was the the sort of the campaign that people played out to choose where he was going to go. Was the intention that she was always going to join the tabletop at some stage as a character? Uh, Because then obviously she did with the the most recent box. Or was that a piece of narrative that you'd already worked on? And then, you know what, it would be good to add her uh, to the the pantheon of of, uh, gods later on. Well, I think at that stage, we'd we'd almost pretty much decided she was going to show up. Um, And so being able to introduce her early um, as a, a, a teaser that maybe people didn't necessarily realise was a teaser. I mean, she was such a big character. Yeah, so it was nice with people, oh, she's really cool. It's like, yes, she is. Just you wait. (laughs) We've got artwork already and she looks incredible. Um, And, uh, yeah, so she, it was helpful to be able to to use her in that that way. Uh, But actually when I wrote the Fate of Eric campaign, I took it in a very different direction, which I didn't end up, we didn't end up using and it didn't quite work. And then it was when I was reflecting on Dranya and we did get the artwork for her that I realised actually she can be a very good guide through this situation for Eric, not helping him, hindering him, really just showing him a path he can follow Mm. and helping him make a choice so um she she developed very quickly and very strongly through the fate of eric campaign so yeah she's going to definitely going to be appearing in book three for sure i like the sound of that um because we i I desperately want to know this the characters you've always said that there's going to be four factions as far as i remember tom Every character is very unique in how they play. It's not just a sort of stat stick. Generally, there's um, no. signature moves for most, if not all, of the characters, and that's they're, they're sort of out left field. Is the reason to keep it to four so that you can have both defined characters who are unique people in and of themselves, and it, it sort of condenses what way you plan out the the stats and the gameplay because the that balance of uniqueness must be tricky to keep we so so we have we're this obviously we're about to bring this fourth faction um but there's sort of sub factions within so in in the shades of moon reach you've effectively got the risen um which are uh, characters that were entombed under Moonreach when the gnomes tunneled under and detonated it, and they're being released, and the spirits who are who have been released from the Deadlands, mm-hmm. um, the afterlife. So, even though there's only two, um, sort of, so even though there's four factions within each faction, there's plenty of room for these kind of sub factions. Mm-hmm. So, there's. Uh, I, I'm conscious of not allowing the game to get too bloated. So every new character has got to kind of do something that's really cool. Mm-hmm. But we're not in any any uh, chance of running out um, anytime soon. And with this new faction, we wanted to make sure it had a unique play style as well. So sometimes when um, when I'm thinking of character rules or I'm playtesting with Joe or Joe's coming up with ideas, I'll kind of think, right, this theme, you know, like the bubbling up theme, with you know, plumping together, right, that's just for gnomes and Commonwealth, they don't get magical uh, damage. And we kind of separate things out and go, this faction, like Leshevold, don't have armor generally. 
there's like two characters that have got any armor. They just don't get it, but they get better healing than everyone else. So I've been, it was quite fun to go, right, there's certain territories that we haven't touched yet. Um, we can make that the property of a new faction. And one thing that I thought would be really fun is they don't get healing. Mm. Everyone else has got healing. The healing spell costs you um, two energy. It's got an eight inch range. It always works on blue. It's, you know, everyone's got it. What if there was a faction that didn't have that? That'd be really cool. Um, what if they use reanimation instead? Um, what if we have um, the resist hand make more difference? So I remember um, doing demos to people, you know, and the first time you're explaining what does the resist hand do, well, it gives you some information about what the opponent's got or not, and you might have a catastrophe in it. And I always thought, what if it did more? What if you could do, what if you play things from your resist hand on occasion? That'd be a cool mechanic. I don't want to just stick it on one character. I think that could be a whole, like, I think there's enough territory in that to be um, sort of the property of a new faction that doesn't exist yet. So that, so occasionally, like, like I've got my big old pile of cool ideas for characters that just sit there until their time to shine. I've kind of got a big old list of cool mechanical themes. So it's, you know, it's, it's been quite good fun to kind of finally got, start to flesh some of those things out. And also, it's worthwhile remembering the people who already play who may not be interested in a, in a faction or so. You need to, we need to think about them too, and releasing things that that they can use. So, Dominion Humans, um, for example, making sure that they've got something new in book three that's coming out as well. So, there's there's also that aspect to, that we think about when coming up with new characters to make sure. Yes, those people who are asking for things probably now may not see them yet. Um, but once we've got the shades launch out of the way, actually some of those things that people are saying, oh, I hope there's X, Y and Z in a completely different faction. It's like, there might be. Mm-hmm. We'll have to wait and see. But we've got the shades to do first. It can take a surprisingly long time, to be honest, from thinking about that's a great idea to actually publishing it. Um, so, but, you know, the the Dominion Humans, it was a good point. Narratively, they're very linked to the Shades of Moonreach. Um, so we wanted there to be a box set in the Shades faction that was cross-faction with Dominion that you can plug in alongside your um, Masquerade. Because mm-hmm. I always like it with every troop box, there's, there's kind of multiple ways that you can branch out from it. So with the Masquerade, for example, you can go with the... Um, Dominion human pirates or towards the curse, and I kind of like, wouldn't it be cool if there was a branch into the shades if you want to take them in an even darker direction? So one of the box sets in the Kickstarter is kind of designed with that purpose in mind. I'm assuming that's the grave diggers part of that. Yeah, that's um, right. Eternal servitude is the box set. So it's got um a grave digger who's an actual real human. Um he's been digging up the, the shades, like literally physically digging them up. Um, he's obviously a Dominion human. Um, there is um, Viscount Default, who is uh, an Arabian Default, aka the Duchess's. Uh, uncle. Susan, correct me, uncle. I was going to say uncle, but I thought <laughs> I better not get this wrong. <laughs> uh, and he's um, he's been buried uh, and has re-emerged, and there might be some friction between those two because uh, they're both. Not very nice people, um, but maybe they'll maybe they'll make their peace. Uh, who knows? Um, and there's a, a servant in that box set who um, just wants to die. Quite frankly, he wants to stop serving all these assholes that should be allowed to go to the Deadlands and and have some peace. But they keep dragging him out, making him butter their toast or whatever it is that he does for them. I, I can understand that. They, I mean, the first. Um, the first time we see the residents of Moonreach or read about them, I think it was in the Tyrants of Tiber. Um, yeah. Where he, he, the, uh, oh, I can't remember his name. Professor Buffett. Professor. Professor, yes. Yeah. He falls into the pit and discovers that they're still having a massive feast and have been since presumably uh, the whole place was sunken um, by Jack. So, and all they're doing is eating regurgitating and eating the food in a, a, a grim parody of life. So I can imagine when you're a butler and, and you're having to deal with that day in, day out, you would get Pretty gross, just you know, thinking, sweep, mm-hmm. sweeping up after it's all fallen through. Not nice. Just, yeah. Not, not you look pleasant. Uh, but that but, takes us, sorry. 
I was, gonna, I was just going to say, yeah, our um, the, the Treasures and Tyrants of Tor book, book it's kind of like a narrative source book, and we're we're hoping to maybe make that into a bit of a series. Um, so whilst that introduced the Lesher Vault um, in a very narrative way, we might do exactly the same thing with the Shades. So, and the other thing that did introduce the Shades, it gave like a foreshadowing of it. So we can sometimes put these little interesting foreshadowings in these books as well. But these um, Shades. Uh, of Moonreach, basically, they're not quite so much the traditional undead as so much they just never died. Mm. King Churnit had uh, a, some incredible magic and he was able to effectively keep his nobles and his soldiers um, from from death. They just get more and more decrepit. So they were all trapped down there underneath Moonreach and, uh, and now they're free to wreak havoc. Yeah, so we've got... Um for the Shades of Moonreach, uh, you were saying that there's essentially two sub-factions within it. You, you've got the the Risen and the Shades themselves. So one is a, a more physical manifestation of um, undying nobility and, and their ilk. Yeah, that's right. They, they're, they're more akin to sort of zombies and skeletons and things like that, but they, they just never died. They're just 500 years old and they've been trapped. Um, whereas the other side of the faction is um, entities that did die and went to the Deadlands and have now, um, as the magical crust has been broken and shown it's been released from the Deadlands, they've flowed out with him. Um, so it gives us our kind of two flavours, although you can mix and match them quite nicely. There's kind of the seeds of, a, of almost a third um, kind of branch, and that's the really really weird stuff that inhabits the deadlands so as well as you know formerly dead humans and formerly dead forms being able to come back there is also just some bat crazy stuff um that's never been to you know on the land of Torba and just thinks it's to them it's just this really weird place that they can run around and have a jolly good time and who is responsible for the psycho bumps <laughs> That, that's the big question. Where did that? What fever dream slash cheese that, nightmare spawned that, this? That was something that I wanted because Moonstone's well known for being whimsical and being fun and being a bit silly. And I thought, how do we do undead in a way which feels Moonstone? There's lots of other, you know, grim, dark undeads out there. This needs to have some of that all mixed into the pot with some things that people might not have expected. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at some Heronius Bosch paintings of hell and looking at like these eggs running around and looking at all these med medieval manuscripts of, you know, snail knights and, yeah. you know, people sticking their heads into their own orifices. And I was yes. like, this is mad. Medieval people were mental. <laughs> I want to <call> that. <laughs> that's, that's a really interesting angle to take. Because obviously undead, you know, they need to look aesthetically old older so i was looking more at kind of medieval kind of art mm. for inspiration for their styles and i was coming across this really weird stuff going that's quite moonstone actually that's just weird enough to work i think i mean it has that feeling um of of the old school european writings you know things like um the stuff that brothers grim would put down whereas even though they're children's stories they're cautionary tales they may be funny and a bit weird and gingerbread house you say and lost in the woods but most end up with somebody being pushed into an oven or eaten uh, so, grim, so whimsical like, doesn't necessarily mean the, safe no. <laughs> I, I think the other thing is i've always been kind of conscious with moonstone is not to just do the same as what everyone else has done you know both mechanically and artistically um it's a very crowded competitive space and and i i think it's important to keep trying to push out in new directions and a lot of these kind of historical things and historical fairy tales are absolutely weird they're so weird they're only not weird to us because we've heard them so many times but they're they're bonkers so yeah i thought rather than just doing the same old the same old just you know it, you know again let's like let's do something weird <laughs> people like it they might or they might not but I remember when I wanted to put fairies in the game, people were saying, oh, no, no, I don't think you should put fairies in that. But that won't, you know, that nobody's done that before. That won't work. And I was like, I don't care. I'm going to do it anyway. I think it'd be fun. And then, uh, and that's 
you know, turned out to be quite popular. So I'm sticking my neck on the line a little bit by uh, maybe doing a few unexpected things. So let's just yeah. see if it's a total disaster or not, or if people actually like it. We'll find out soon. I, I think it's probably going to be safe to assume that people will like it. Um, talking about the, the Kickstarter then, the upcoming Shades of Moonreach Kickstarter, there's been a, a host of reveals done across YouTube and various other places. Uh, and so far we've seen, um, I think nine different characters, I want to say, and eight psycho pumps. Now, given that trip boxes are generally three in a box, is the, the Kickstarter going to be much bigger than, than what's been revealed? Or are we going to be seeing a, a smaller initial set and then maybe some, I so the, the, going forward. the Kickstarter's eight box sets. Okay. So it's a, a pretty good size. I looked back at our Lushable um, mm -hmm. Kickstarter and it wasn't for anywhere near that many. <laughs> I think that was something like six, five or six. So it's, it's a bigger launch. But I think it's important when you launch a new faction that, particularly as the other factions have grown, that, that you're not handicapped by playing the new faction, that you've got a sort of similar amount of choice um so yeah it's uh i don't know when this is airing um in, in the case that i'll maybe live now um and i'm hoping to sneak it out before so people get forewarning okay my editors don't know this yet hi <laughs> editors <laughs> so um yeah there's there's plenty of variety anyway with the the launch then so obviously you've got parity there between the, the different factions um the, the launch of the boxes generally come ahead of the book so we might not see a, a book containing it in the same way the arising had a, a lot of the stuff from lashville but it came much later and ha added the campaign system and the like um is there a plan then well you've already said there is a book coming will there be uh, a significant add-on like the campaign system to it or is this so far out that you're just concentrating on the narrative to go with the book the, there will be new mechanical ideas, but it's it's a little way out. We're just, just focusing on the miniatures, first of all, so that there's enough miniatures on the table so that people can play the new faction, and then we'll be focusing on the book. Mm -hmm. So it will follow the same sort of template that we did with the Arising, where you bring out enough models when, with the Lash Vault, where you bring out enough models that people can play, then we'll focus on the book, which will have some new mechanical themes as well, mm -hmm. um, and we'll the shades kickstarter won't be every single model from that book you know there'll still be um release waves that we can do from that book it'll just be kind of the bulk and the core of the new faction and also we have to get to a stage with the book where the characters that haven't been released yet the their abilities are pretty much nailed down because we have images of their cards in the book so we also we have to wait until the, most of the the bulk is done before we can then finalize the book. But that's lucky for me because it does give me a bit more time to get the the narrative down and uh, yeah, make sure that all the characters are settled with their personalities before we we write it. Yeah, have you started the the sort of the broad strokes of the book? Because I know things like this they're planned well in advance. So yes yeah so i have um most of the chapters are noted so i know what's going to happen in most of them it's going to be a similar kind of length to the arising um so novella size in in total um so most of the chapters are outlined um we will reuse some of the fate of eric uh narrative because it does fit, fold into what's going on at the time. Um, but I might flesh some of it out or I might tweak bits of it. So it, it won't necessarily be as it is right now on our website. Um, but yes, the the what's going on at the same time as Eric is having his path. Revelation. <laughs> uh, on the, yeah, revelations and decisions. Um, that needs to be explained. And um, a lot of what... I do when, I mean, Tom's already said he comes up with the mad ideas and then it's down to Tom to work out, uh, down to Joe to work out how the gameplay works. Alongside that is then down to me to say, well, how does this work in this world? How do people feel about death and dying and what happens after that point? And so where do all these weird little guys, that are, the psychopomps come from? What are they? And yeah, so I'm going to try and explain some of that in the, the narrative of book three as well. That'll be fascinating because for people who, who look at Moonstone, the cards have got a wealth of 
information on them and beautiful detail. Um, the rules that you get in the two player starter set is just a set of rules. So people could potentially get into the game and not have that um, indulgence that the, the, the storylines are, they don't need to be there for a good miniatures game, but for a good world, all of these layers of story and myth and folk tale that all come together in the various places build so much more uh, into what's happening. And I look at it and I think, RPG? I mean, there's there's so much potential, even if the, the, the miniatures game is finite, to look beyond tabletop miniatures and, and jump around into the world. And with the, the timeline that went out on your YouTube channel a little while ago, and it explains where the Forgotten King came in and things that have happened subsequent uh, to that, you're looking at it and you're going, well, there's more to explore than just what we can physically look at from the miniature side. Have you ever thought about exploring either through something like an RPG or through longer form um, short stories, novels, that sort of thing? Yeah, we, we've talked about it. <laughs> we've talked about it quite a lot. <laughs> um, obviously, the Moonstone Skirmish game is is in a really good place, and it's building up a lot of traction, and it's um, it's it's you know quite a bit of, of work, and it's been really good fun. And in the process of working through uh, the Moonstone Skirmish game, the world is being fleshed out in a in a very organic way. But it is starting to get very deep and rich now. And you know, you're not the first person to bring up, you know, the, some of those ideas. And they're definitely definitely in our minds. So yeah. sure it yes. Well, one thing that um that very few people get to see, only those of us who work at Goblin King Games, is is our the tool that we use behind the scenes to plan things and marketing or to work out characters, that kind of stuff. That is also our internal wiki. It is where um, we, I flesh out the different aspects of the world. So as things come into my brain, I add a few bullet points to actually fully fleshing out um, something called Mushroom Tuft, which is a fairy based event that happens in November where they go out into the woods um, overnight and into across a whole day and go and collect, sing to each other, sing to the trees, heal animals, heal plants they come across, collect mushrooms, sort them into the different types and then have a massive feast at the end of it. And some of the mushrooms are hallucinogenic, so some of the fairies end up getting inspiration um, and then go away and write amazing poetry and create plays and write songs. And as part of the feast, they then do this big presentation and present the final mushroom from the previous year to Diana. That's in the wiki. <laughs> now everyone watching this will have heard it. Um, but it's it's things like that that we we would love to do more with and, and share more with and and allow people to create worlds from as well and and enjoy as much as I enjoy just coming up with these weird ideas and writing them on a bit of paper as well. Does your wiki bear a resemblance to that notice board with all the red threads <laughs> attached to post-it notes? <laughs> Yes. Postcards. <laughs> yes, I do feel like that guy on occasion. Uh yeah, when when I'm like, how do we get to the end point? And then yeah, trying to work out the different characters that will come in at various points. I, and I generally just throw problems at Susie. I'm like, I want this because I think it'd be cool. <laughs> and then Susie's got like, oh, how does that work? But well, yeah, so <laughs> but we get there in the end. It's like, and we, we get the cool things and we get it making sense. <laughs> That's what I like to hear. Uh, obviously, the the plans for for Moonstone push on years into the making. Uh, people will be able to go and have a look at, like I say, the Kickstarter should hopefully be upcoming. We'll drop links below so that they can go and be notified when it launches, uh, and also to the the playthrough videos if you haven't seen how the game plays because it is absolutely wonderful. There's one thing I want to ask before I let you go though, because I constantly constantly talk about it whenever I do unboxings and that's the quality of the resin casts who does your resin casting these days because they are stupendously good and I keep meaning to ask yeah it's yes. it's uh, CMA creative right so it's, it's our fourth casting partner fourth, third casting partner now so um and I think their their casting is super super good um they process 
Um, I, I can't give away trade secrets, but their process results in no bubbles. So they don't have to put risers and feeds, you know, extra bits yeah, sticking yeah. in in order to let the bubbles get out. They've got other other ways of doing it. So they're really, really crisp, aren't they? It's literally just brew with a feed into the sprue. And then the model, there's nothing, you know, other than like very, very fine, like papery, uh, you know, thinner than paper, but micro flash. There's no clean, you know, no clean up to do really. So we're really, really happy with them. Yeah, you should pass along my thanks. I've worked with a lot of resin over the years. And for some people viewing this who may have only worked with plastic, the idea that figures will be resin based sends chills and panics through them. But they are absolutely wonderful to work well, with. Um, I mean, so re resin's obviously got the big advantages in holding detail better. But also, what's becoming more of a factor for people, I think, is the small number of parts. Mm. Metal mold, uh, plastics made in metal mold, steel molds that can only be, you know, they can't, they can't undercut at all. Yes. Whereas uh, resins made with silicon molds that can sort of fold round, so you can get away with quite a lot of undercutting and, and make them, you know, highly detailed dynamic model in just two, three, maybe four pieces, which in plastic would have been, I don't know, twelve pieces. Yeah, that's good to know. So there you mm -hmm. have it, folks. Um, Definitely, if you haven't checked out Moonstone, you should go and have a look. Start with the figures. You'll fall in love with those, and then you can get invested in the storyline as well. I'm fascinated to see what else comes post the horizon and the uh, the shades of Moonreach, because there's lots of little uh, interesting Easter eggs and, and nods to popular culture that spring up throughout the writing as well that I really enjoy, like the Stannis stairlift in the Elrich Tower. <laughs> that one made me laugh out loud. When I read that. It's a delightful, I'm glad you spotted that. It's a delightful <laughs> world that everybody needs to play in. That's all I'm saying. Um, if you've not got involved, do it so now. If you've uh, fancy a bit of fun dead, which is like undead but more fun and whimsical, uh, then check out the Shades from Moonreach. Until next time, bye bye. Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on. <laughs>